Hello and welcome from the First United Methodist Church in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, but not located there right now. I'm at St. Peter's Episcopal Church, also in Phoenixville. And the reason I'm here today is to share with you one of their windows. Later in the video, in the sermon, I'm going to be talking a lot about a man named Polycarp. Um, it means many fingers, but I think he probably really only had 10. And they happen to have a window that shows a picture of Polycarp. If I can get it in here. And here he's pictured talking with St. John. It's doubtful that they ever met, but it's pretty clear they may have had some mutual acquaintances. And while I'm on the subject, let me share another window from this church. On the other side of St. Peter's Sanctuary is another window. Here we have a more familiar face and a more familiar name. It's John Wesley. He was an Anglican priest, priest in the Church of England. And Methodism began as part of a revival movement within the Church of England. And here he is pictured on his trip to America. He served as chaplain to the newly founded colony of, in Georgia. It didn't go very well. That's another story altogether. But here you see him preaching, preaching to the settlers, the white settlers, and also to the people there who were enslaved. And there's a very large picture of him that looms above that smaller one. So we'll hear a little bit more about Polycarp as this goes on. But for now, wherever we are, and in whatever way we worship the Lord, let us worship together. Having returned from St. Peter's, we read from the first letter of Peter, chapter 3, verses 13 through 16. Now who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good?
But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. But in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who asks for an accounting of the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. First Peter is one of those letters that's tucked away in the New Testament. And we only read a few sections from it in church every year. It never really caught on with the people who put the lectionary together. It never really caught on with the major theologians who are so prominent and, and deal with deep and pressing and important questions. It doesn't have the ringing rhetoric of Romans about righteousness and salvation. It doesn't have the soaring tone of John's letters. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What the first letter of Peter has is advice. Advice on how to behave and how to avoid persecution. And it has more advice on what to do if the Romans do decide to persecute you anyway. This is not a letter that was written for someone who is sitting down and thinking, what do I say to people about the deep questions of the faith? This is a letter that's written to people who have faith but need to know how to live it out under the worst and most difficult circumstances. These are words that were written for people living in the first century as Christians. And these are words that were written for people that were living in Montgomery in 1963. These are words that are written for people living in a Russian gulag. These are people who live in the Cultural Revolution in China. These are words that are written for people who are marching for equality. These are words that are written for people who are trying to live a faithful life in places where people want them to just shut up and go away. And in many cases, are willing to make it happen. The letter probably was not written directly by Peter himself, but may have been written by somebody who knew him. It certainly was written in the earliest days of Christianity because it was a letter that was well known to the Christians living in the town of Smyrna in what is now southwestern Turkey, a town that now goes by the name Izmir. You can see how Smyrna became Izmir over the years. This letter is quoted heavily in 
another letter that an early bishop of Smyrna, Polycarp, wrote to the church in Philippi, telling them about what was going on there in Smyrna. In Polycarp, all of the stuff that's there in First Peter about what to say or do if the Romans seize you and demand that you offer sacrifice to the emperor turned out to be practical advice. Very practical. Way too practical. We know that because of yet another letter that was written by somebody in the church in Smyrna to the church in yet another town, one called Philomelium, around the year 155 or 156 AD, that tells the story of what became of Polycarp. The title gives it away. The Martyrdom of Polycarp. And it begins with a description of other believers' deaths. Descriptions that are graphic enough that if it were turned into a movie, it would have to have at least an R rating for violence. The letter says that Polycarp, when these gruesome gruesome persecutions began in Smyrna. Polycarp, who was leader of the church there, lay low, and he just kept out of the way. And then the executions that were going on became nastier and nastier. And he decided it was time to get out of town. He wasn't running away from trouble the first time around. He had been visiting people in prison. But it was clear that the Romans were going to be trying to destroy the leadership. And if they could destroy the leadership, who knows what would happen to the church as a whole. And so he got out of town. And he very narrowly escaped the city as the authorities got closer and closer to him. Out there in the countryside, he moved from farm to farm for a while. But the Romans who had been trying to find him in the city were now trying to find him in the countryside. And they reached a farm where he had been not long before. And they took two of the slaves who were working on the farm and tortured them until they found out where Polycarp had gone. Let me read directly from the story here on this part. Late in the evening, they came up with him and found him in bed in the upper room of a small cottage. Even so, he could have escaped to another farm, but he did not wish to do so, saying, God's will be done. Thus, when he heard of their arrival, he went downstairs and talked with them while those who looked on marveled at his age and constancy and at how there should be such zeal at the arrest of so old a man. Uh, I didn't mention his age, did I? And that part is going to make a difference in what happens as the story unfolds. So remember, when they arrested him, he was up there. And so the writer continues. 
Straightway he ordered food and drink, as much as they wished, to be set before them at that hour. And he asked them to give him an hour so that he might pray undisturbed. And when they consented, he stood and prayed. Being so filled with the grace of God, he could not hold his peace for two hours. To the amazement of those who heard, and many repeated, excuse me, and many repented that they had come to get such a devout old man. Unquote. Of course, they then had to take him back into the city for a trial. And the martyrdom of Polycarp describes his trial. It describes confrontation between him and the local magistrate, in the course of which Polycarp is condemned and he's sent to prison, and eventually he's taken out of prison and carried to the arena. And on that day, he was brought out. The proconsul, the judge, in the arena, surrounded by the crowds who had just been there, happily witnessing more executions, gave him one last chance. He pointed to a statue of the emperor and said, Take the oath and I shall release you. Curse Christ. There was the choice laid out plainly in front of him. Polycarp said, 86 years I have served him, and he never did me any wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? 86 years. He sums up 86 years by saying how good the Lord had been to him. He doesn't go into great detail. He doesn't give a theological basis that's already there for why he will not curse the Lord. But neither will he turn his back on him. 86 years old. And he stands trial and says, go ahead. The martyrdom of Polycarp describes a little bit more give and take but that was the core of his response. 86 years I have served him, and he never did me any wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? The letter goes on to describe his actual death. They tell in the letter about how he prayed as they set fire because he was to be burned at the stake. And as he prayed and the flames rose higher and higher and higher around him, the executioner had to be sent in because the flames were not burning him up. He himself was not catching fire. He was just going on and praying more and more and more. And the executioner was sent in with a knife to stab him. And as the story goes on, it says that the people who were watching could see his soul leaving his body like a dove. And so much blood poured out of him that it extinguished the flames. The blood of the martyrs destroying 
the flames of persecution through faithfulness. That's how to read that story. Not just as a fairy tale with, look what happened to this man, look at the magical way that God protected him, but no. Look at God protecting him. Look at how God will protect and is protecting all the people to whom he has been faithful and from whom faithfulness is now being drawn and exhibited. Like I said, this is not some bedtime story for a five-year-old. It's got blood, it's got flames, it's got hope. And it does show how to answer persecution. And I would say, not only that broad, fierce, violent form, but any lesser form of even derision or insult that anybody experiences based on their faith. The same thing that First Peter had taught him. In his letters, Polycarp had quoted First Peter to a great extent. And it's how it speaks to us. You know, in our day and in our setting, it's unlikely that we'll be arrested for worshiping one God instead of many. But it is not unlikely that you may encounter some condescension and, depending on who you are and where you are, possibly abuse for believing in any God at all. Do not be intimidated, but in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands of you an account of the fate of the hope that is within you. Yet, do it with gentleness and with reverence. If you find yourself in some strange position, meet that abuse with kindness the way that Polycarp offered a good meal to his captors, gave them a chance to sit down and rest while he prayed. Meet what comes to you with prayer. And no, your prayer doesn't have to be two hours long at the top of your voice so that people hear it and repent of what they're doing. Though if that is how the Spirit moves you, go ahead and do it. But remember to pray to God who hears you, whether it's with words or whether it's long or whether it's quiet and brief. when that kind of opposition meets you. If it meets you, meet it with assurance and certainty, confidence, and meet it simply with a statement of what the Lord has done for you. You don't have to speak for anybody else, but for yourself, speak and say, I have known the Lord for all these years, and he's been with me. And I trust him to continue with me to the end.
You don't have to provide an elaborate theological statement or get caught up in a philosophical debate. And most of those, most of those prove fruitless to begin with. But if that's who you are, be ready for that. But tell it as your faith, as your experience, as your reason for being friends with the one who first loved you. Best of all, answer it with the way you live before it ever comes to that. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. The best witness, as it turns out, isn't what we say, but who we are. And, and those two do go together. Don't make any mistake of that, they are connected. Just as Jesus' witness to the divine love wasn't just his teaching, but the way he lived it out. And not just the way he lived, but the way he died. And not just the way he died, but the way that God raised him up and restored him which is part of our story, too. And the friendship that we share with him and he with us is as true and as constant in our own years as they were in the 86 years of Polycarp's life. And the best way to meet anything is to let people see that ahead of time, because that will confirm anything that you may end up saying in good times or in bad times. And all of it ends up being to God's glory. Amen. So go forth into the world in peace. Hold fast to that which is good. Love and serve God and your neighbor in all that you do, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us now and forever. Amen. Amen.